Hi there. In this video, we will learn about different types of masses. Well, the thing is, the atoms are so tiny and so are their masses. You can imagine how challenging it must would be in the older times to find masses of such small species. Well, in today's time, we do have sophisticated techniques like mass spectrometry for determining the atomic masses with fair accuracy. But in the 19th century, scientists could determine the mass of one atom relative to another. Hydrogen being the lightest atom was arbitrarily assigned mass of one, you know, without any units. And other elements were assigned masses relative to it. Now, what is it that we are currently using? Well, the current system of atomic masses is based on carbon as the reference. Well, the reference chosen was actually carbon-12 isotope and not carbon-14 isotope. Let's quickly revise what are isotopes. So, isotopes are species that have the same number of protons. That means the atomic number is same, but different number of neutrons. That means the mass number is different. As we can clearly see here, carbon-6. So, atomic number out here is 6. We can represent atomic number with Z and mass number. We represent mass number with A. So, mass number you can see is 12. That is what is our standard that we are using and not this carbon-14 isotope. Okay. So, you might ask why carbon-12 only? Why not something else? There are many reasons for it. Number one is carbon-12 isotope is stable and abundant. So, it is non-radioactive isotope and it is found in high natural abundance. Okay. Then we can also say it is more accurate in measurements. So, using carbon-12 avoids the errors that occurred with hydrogen, which has multiple isotopes and is actually very super light, making it hard to weigh precisely. Third one is it has even number of protons and neutrons. How is that helpful? Well, the answer lies in how these six protons and six neutrons are present in the nucleus. The protons and neutrons actually pair up inside the nucleus. At this stage, we can't go deep into the concept, but to put it in simplified form, these proton, proton and neutron, neutron pairs create lower energy and hence more stability. Okay. Now, next comes the international agreement. Before 1961, chemists used oxygen-16 as the reference, while physicists used the average atomic mass of natural oxygen, which is oxygen-16, oxygen-17 and oxygen-18. Well, of course, this led to a lot of inconsistencies. And this is why in 1961, IUPIC adopted carbon-12 as the universal standard to unify all scientific communities. Okay. And hey, like I said, in 1961, IUPIC declared that 1 AMU is actually 1 by 12, the mass of carbon-12 isotope. We'll talk about this further, but this international agreement gave the world a universal and consistent standard. So now what is this AMU? Let's try to explore it further. So AMU can be defined as the mass exactly equal to one twelfth of the mass of one carbon 12 atom. Okay. So, one AMU is equal to one by 12, the mass of carbon 12. But I can also take this here. Mass of one carbon 12 atom is actually 12 AMU. At present, this AMU has been replaced by U, which we call as unified mass. Okay, now in this AMU system, masses of all other atoms are given relative to this standard. One atomic mass unit, like now we know, is defined as mass exactly equal to one twelfth of the mass of the carbon 12 isotope, right? So now what if we want to find the mass of hydrogen atom in AMU, okay? So we know that one AMU is one twelfth the mass of the carbon 12 isotope, which we find out to be equal to 1.66056 into 10 to the power minus 24 gram, okay? Now, if you're talking about the mass of one hydrogen atom, we can actually find it out and it comes out to be equal to 1.6736 into 10 to the power minus 24 grams. Now mind you it is in grams and we have used sophisticated techniques to find out this mass right but we are trying to understand how to write the mass of hydrogen in terms of AMU okay okay so this mass is given in grams 
In order to find the mass in AMU, what we can do is divide the mass of one atom of hydrogen, which is in grams, with mass of one twelfth of the carbon twelve isotope. So when we divide, we get approximately one point zero zero eight AMU as the mass of hydrogen atom in AMU. Okay. It is interesting that when we use atomic masses of elements in calculations, we actually use average atomic masses of element. There is another concept now that we need to dive into, which is the percentage abundance. Percentage abundance is defined as percentage value of the quantity of isotopes available in nature for a given element. Okay, so you will see that we have, let's say, one element. It will have different isotopes. Every isotope will have a certain percentage abundance, and every isotope has a specific mass also. So we need to multiply the mass with the percentage abundance, and we would have to do the summation of all the different isotopes. Okay, okay. Before we understand percentage abundance from the chemistry perspective, let's make use of my favorite fruit out here, mangoes. Now, my question to you is, what is the average weight of the mango in the basket? And you can see we have two different types of mangoes out here, isn't it? One is a yellow color, one is a reddish color. So this is the first variety of the mango. Let's call it Alfonso mango, one of my favorites. And the weight of Alfonso mango is two hundred gram, and sixty percent of the basket is filled with these Alfonso mangoes. Okay. The other one, let's say, is Sindura mango, the red one. Sindura is red. So the weight. Of one mango is one fifty gram, and let's say forty percent of the basket is filled with the sindura mango or the red mango. Okay, now do not get confused between the term weight and mass here. So even though when it comes to physics, weight and mass are different, but here we are using it interchangeably. Okay, so in order to find the average weight of a mango in the basket, we can take the percentage abundance of the Alfonso mango into the weight of one mango. Plus percentage abundance of the Sindura mango into the weight of one mango. Okay, so sixty by hundred into two hundred plus forty by hundred into one fifty. So once we solve it, what we get is you can see we have one twenty plus sixty. All right. Okay, so that means one eighty gram shall be the average weight of a mango in the basket. Now, just like how we have found average weight of a mango, let's try to find the average atomic mass of carbon. So we have three isotopes of carbon: carbon twelve, carbon thirteen, and carbon fourteen. The percentage abundance of carbon twelve is ninety eight point eight nine two percent. It's the maximum. Carbon thirteen is one point one zero eight percent. Carbon fourteen is very very less, two into ten to the power minus ten. So you can clearly see this percentage is negligible. So when you are doing the calculations on your own, feel free to just ignore carbon fourteen as this is the radioactive isotope which is present in the least amount. So the average atomic mass of carbon shall be. Let's make use of the formula that we learned. We take the summation of the masses into the percentage abundance of all the isotopes. So here we have carbon twelve. Let's put the mass of carbon twelve, that is twelve u, into the percentage abundance ninety eight point eight nine two divided by hundred. That's how we can write it. So it will be point nine eight eight nine two plus the mass of carbon thirteen, which is thirteen u, into one point one zero eight divided by hundred. So it will be point zero one one zero eight. Right now, for carbon fourteen, the mass is fourteen u. Okay. Into two into ten to the power minus ten divided by hundred, which gives you two into ten to the power minus twelve. Like I said, this is negligible, right? So you can absolutely ignore it. When you solve it, what you get is twelve point zero one one u. Now you can do a mental check. Whichever isotope has the highest abundance, you will see that average atomic mass is going to be closer to the mass of that isotope. Okay. So average atomic mass will always be closer to that isotope's mass, which is higher in abundance. All right, now that you know average atomic mass, let's now move on to molecular mass. So molecular mass is the sum of atomic masses of the elements present in a molecule. So now that we have understood atomic masses, molecular masses are going to be very simple. 
let's understand it with an example let's take this water molecule okay since it's a molecule we need to find molecular mass so since we're dealing with a molecule we are now going to use the term molecular mass when we were dealing with atoms we were using the term atomic mass you get it so for this whole molecule if we have to find the molecular mass we would have to take the individual masses of all the atoms which are involved in the molecule in order to find out the molecular mass i can take mass of one hydrogen as one u and since there are two hydrogens so into two plus we have one oxygen and mass of one oxygen let's take it approximately as 16 u so we can say that the mass will be 2 plus 16 u that is 18 u right okay now you can try for methane on your own we have ch4 what do you think will be the molecular mass of ch4 i hope you could do it so carbon for one atom the atomic mass is 12 u Hydrogen, one atom, let's take the atomic mass as 1u. Oh, and mind you, instead of using 12.011u, which is the atomic mass of carbon, and 1.008u, which is the atomic mass of hydrogen, we are approximating the atomic masses to 12u and 1u respectively for carbon and hydrogen, which is the ease of calculation, okay? So yes, the molecular mass is going to be 12 plus 4 into 1 u, that means 16 u, all right? These are the molecular masses. Now, my question to you is, what shall be the mass of sodium chloride, NaCl? Huh? Shall we call it molecular mass? Well, first thing that we need to understand about sodium chloride is, it is an ionic solid. Now, since it's an ionic solid, we should not use the term molecular mass because it's as simple as that, it's not a molecule. So, NaCl does not exist as a single molecule in solids, okay? So, it actually exists like a network of Na plus and Cl minus ions and this network is a repeating network. It's very interesting, you can see how it looks like, it's just like a lattice that we have. A repeating network of Na plus and Cl minus. So how should we find the mass then? So we just calculate the mass of one formula unit. Na plus and Cl minus are a part of one formula unit because these are the ions which are repeating themselves. So what we do is we calculate the mass of one formula unit. Hence the term that we make use of is formula mass and not molecular mass. Okay, so it's time to formally introduce formula mass. So the formula mass of a substance is defined as the sum of atomic masses of constituent atoms in an ionic compound. So here we are dealing with ions, but while finding the formula mass, what do we take? We take the atomic masses of the constituent atoms. For example, sodium atom has atomic mass of 23 u and chlorine atom has an atomic mass of 35.5 u that means formula mass of nacl shall be 23 plus 35.5 u and that is equal to 58.5 u all right so for ionic compounds what we make use of is formula mass